Hi guys, I'm back again today with a continuation to our Sira and this is episode 11. Um, this is, let me see, the second revelation. So the Sira 10 was about the beginning of the revelations and now this is the second revelation. So um, this will be split into three parts, so every day. And yeah, before we do start, don't forget to subscribe, click the bell button and let's go. Get it? Allah Rahman Rahim Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa anwala amma ba'd So in our last uh, Halaqa, we had talked about the beginning of the revelation. We had talked about Jibreel coming down and squeezing the Prophet and reciting to him Iqra' bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq and the fact that when, when the Prophet came back to his wife Khadija, Khadija took him to Waraqa ibn Nawfal and we were still talking a little bit about uh, Waraqa and what happened after that. Uh, in this narration, the question arises how could the Prophet as a prophet, go to somebody who's not a prophet, here for example, Waraka, and get knowledge from him. This doesn't initially make sense. How could a prophet go to a non prophet and ask this non prophet, What's happening to me? Why is this happening? And in response, the scholars say, Because at this point in time, he didn't recognize even that he was a prophet, he didn't understand what's happening to him. And this shows us that knowledge is so sacred and so important that even prophets have no problem learning from non-prophets because the one who knows is more knowledgeable than the one who doesn't and therefore even our prophet muhammad sallam, even though he was a prophet but he doesn't even recognize it now so he goes to somebody who recognizes what is prophecy and again we need to realize the concept of a prophet was unknown to the arabs it was unknown they had long forgotten how was Ibrahim inspired and what was Ismail's message. They just knew it was Tawheed. They didn't have the concept of prophets, just like Hinduism or other religions of our time. They don't have the concept of a human being communicating with Allah. And therefore, when he didn't understand, he went to, who did he go to? Waraqa. And Waraqa is coming from a tradition, there are plenty of prophets. Right? Waraqa was a convert. We said to something that is, it's neither Judaism nor Christianity, let's call it Judeo-Christianity, right? It's his own understanding. So Waraqa understood what is a prophet. And therefore, when the Prophet ﷺ comes to him, immediately he recognizes, this is prophecy. And what you've seen is the angel that communicates with all of the prophets, and it communicates with Musa ﷺ. And of course, he mentioned Musa, because there's more of a similarity with Musa than with Isa, right? There's more of a similarity with Musa alayhi salam than there is with Isa alayhi salam. Now in that uh, riwayah, in that uh, uh, hadith, Khadija says, uh, or Aisha is the one narrating uh, what happened. Khadija uh, tells us the story of Waraqa and Aisha then narrates from uh, indirectly from Khadija that because again Aisha never met Khadija. Her conduit is the Prophet telling as well. Uh, that Shortly after this, Waraqa passed away. Waraqa died. I looked up as many books as I could in the classic references. I could not find any stories about Waraqa other than this, after his Islam. So uh, we only have one tradition from the Prophet ﷺ when he was asked about Waraqa ibn Nawfal and he said, I saw him in Jannah uh, wearing beautiful garments, uh, blessed with beautiful garments. Therefore, this shows that Waraqa was the first convert to Islam and Waraqa was the first Sahabi, and Waraqa was the first person who died of the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, and therefore Waraqa uh, has entered Jannah, and he is of the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. Returning to the hadith that we talked about, the long hadith of the first revelation, uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah continues the story, and he mentions that after this time, the Prophet ﷺ stopped getting any revelation. Fatar al-Wahi. The revelation stopped. Ibn Abbas says that for many days the Prophet ﷺ would wander around Mecca and the valleys of Mecca and the mountains of Mecca wanting to see Jibreel again. But Jibreel would not appear. Some scholars even said this period lasted two or three years, but this is way too much. There's a riwayah from Ibn Abbas, he said 40 days. 
And another famous Sahabi, uh, Tabi'i, Ibn Shahab al-Zuhri, uh, said that this period lasted for many days, so 40 days, many days. That for around a month after, so this is the month of Shawwal, because uh, it was in Ramadan when the revelation began. For an entire month and 10 days, the Prophet is confused. I saw something, but I don't see him again. What is going on, wrong with me? And this is when he says, in the, in, the, in the narration, he says, I was worried for myself. Meaning, he, he thought that he might be going hallucinating. Something's mm -hmm. going mad with him. He doesn't understand what's happening. And he would go to the uh, mountain of Hira, expecting to see Jibreel again. But every day he would go, and there's nothing there. Until finally one day, after we said around 40 days or so, uh, one day the Prophet was coming down the mountain. And he had come down, and he heard his name being called. So he says, I looked in front and I couldn't see anybody. He heard the name again, he looked behind him, there was nobody. He looked again, and he looked again, and he couldn't find, but the name is being called. Now, when somebody calls your name, you really don't think of looking straight up in the air. It's just not in our fitrah to do that. So when he's looking everywhere, and he doesn't see it, then he said, I looked up, and there was the angel that I had seen at Hira. There was the angel, oh, he sees now Jibreel again, I had seen at Hira, on a, on a kursi, on a throne, between the heavens and the earth. And then he said, I began to tremble, out of fear. Now subhanAllah, he's wanting to see Jibreel, but when he sees him, it's simply too much for him. And he begins to tremble, and in one, re in one report, he fell down on his knees out of shock and out of fear. He fell down on his knees. And then he got up again, and out of fear, out of panic, once again he begins to rush home. And this is when he runs home to Khadija, and he says, Zammiluni, Zammiluni. This is the time he says this again, cover me up. And again, this is something many of us have not experienced fear of this nature. May Allah protect us. But when you are so much afflicted with fear, you literally begin to feel cold. You begin to tremble, right? That type of fear. So he's feeling this fear. After all, he's seen the angel Jibreel in his original form. He's seen a huge beast or creature, if you like, mm -hmm. of Allah, uh, you know, in between the heavens and the earth. And therefore, he begins to tremble. So he runs back to Khadija. He says, Zambiluni, Zambiluni. And this was when the second revelation uh, was revealed revealed and these were the first six or seven verses of Ya ayyuhal muzzammil qum al-layla illa sorry Ya ayyuhal muddathir qum fa'anthir wa rabbaka fa'kabbir wa thiyabaka fa'tahir wa rujza fahjur wa la tamnun tastakthir wa li rabbika fasbir these seven verses of Surah Muddathir they were revealed and therefore this is the second revelation of the Quran the seven verses of Surah Al-Muddathir now here what is the wisdom of uh, these 30, 40 days that the Prophet was not inspired. So, scholars say that this was to prepare him for the second meeting, to make him recover, to recollect his energies, to make him feel enthused, because now look at what's happening. He's coming every day to try to meet Jibreel. And despite this preparation, when he sees him, he becomes terrified. Imagine if it had come immediately, he would have been even more terrified. So this was to prepare him to calm his nerves down. Despite that, he still reacted the way that he did. And all of this shows us over and over again the humanity of our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. It shows us that he didn't pre-plan this. This is not the, the thing that a, uh, a fraud, a charlatan, uh, 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 a two-faced liar billah, would do. If somebody wanted to invent a grandiose story, and there are people who claim to be prophets. Even here in America, there's a person, and in, uh, there used to be a person 100 years ago who claimed to be a prophet. And uh, in, in India, there was a person who claimed to be a prophet 100 years ago. If you look at their stories, the stories that they invent are all grandiose. They're all, this happened and that happened and I did this. They put themselves to be the hero, right? If you look at the story of the Prophet Islam, you find a human reaction. A reaction that could not be except from a sincere person. That he wasn't expecting this, he didn't want it. When it happens, he's terrified. And he goes to his wife and he says, Zammiluni, Zammiluni. And what is this revelation? What is the relevance of these verses? Ya ayyuhal muddathir. Notice as well, by the way, that from the context, a lot of people think that the revelation occurred when he saw Jibreel. No, the revelation occurred in the house of Khadija. When the Prophet went back, this means Jibreel must have followed him. And when he's covered up with the cloak, with the garment, in the house of Khadija, Jibreel inspires him. And Jibreel speaks to him. And Jibreel says, Ya ayyuhal muddathir. O you who is wrapped up in a garment, 
O you who has the shawl around you. Ya ayyuhal muddathir. And the symbolism here, O you who are living in comfort, because when you're in a shawl, you're in comfort. Ya ayyuhal muddathir. You're so comfortable here. Stop this life of ease. Qum. Stand up. You were sitting down. You were easy. Now you need to be active. Get rid of this cloak. Stand up. Qum. So there's an element here of you need to do something. You need to be proactive. You need to go out. You need to leave the sheltered life that you are living. You need to leave that, that, that uh, 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 if you like, warmth of the blanket. Get rid of this. You know, the safety blanket. Even children have it. It's a safety blanket. You feel comfortable. And Allah says, no. Qum fa'andir. Stand up. Get rid of this comfort zone. And go out and warn the people. Qum fa'andir. Wa rabbaka fakabbir. And while you're doing this warning, then glorify your Lord. Praise Him. Worship Him. وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَهِّرْ And your clothes, your garments, make sure that they are clean. There's a, again a lot of symbolism here. First and foremost, literally, make sure you have clean clothes. Don't have any najasa on them. Have a presentable appearance. All of this is literal. Then there's a sim symbolism here. That make sure that you have no sins to pollute you. Just like you're going to have clean clothes, make sure you have a pure soul, a good heart. And as for idols, get rid of them and leave them. Leave all idols. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that as you're preaching to the public, make sure that you are worshipping Allah, purifying yourself and leaving all false idols. Uh, this is a complicated translation here. Manna. Uh, means to, to remind somebody of a favor they've done to you. This is what manna means, right? And Allah tells him, don't remind people of the favors that you've done, because in order, if you, if you did this, what, why, would, why does somebody do this? True. You do yeah. it because you want to get the favor paid back. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? Mm -hmm. So when you give somebody a loan, then a few months later you say, Akhi, remember I gave you a loan, can I just borrow your car for a week? You know, you just remind him of the favor, right? And when you remind somebody of a favor, then you get that favor back somehow. So Allah is saying, when you do good, don't do it to get the favors back from people. Anything that you do, do it for the sake of Allah. Don't do it to get repaid back by the other people. And again, this goes back to the concept of sincerity. That, us, that when somebody does something purely self. for the sake of Allah, nobody can challenge that person's intention. But when somebody has other intentions, then it tarnishes that person's reputation. And therefore the Prophet ﷺ was not allowed to take zakat money. He was not allowed to take charity. He was not allowed to do anything uh, for, this, uh, for the sake of the religion and get money for that. He didn't do that. Because Allah Azzawajal told him, قُلْ لَا أَسَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مَالًا قُلْ لَا أَسَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا Tell the people, I'm not getting your money. I'm not getting your sustenance. So. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded him, and of course, Wali Rabbika Fasbir, the last ayah to be revealed, Wali Rabbika Fasbir, and for the sake of your Lord, be patient. There is an indication that you're going to suffer calamities. There's an indication that life is going to be difficult. You're going to need patience. And the only way you're going to be patient is by doing it for the sake of your Lord. The only way you will be patient is if you do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this leads us to a little bit of a, a, a tangent here, and it is a necessary tangent but it is a theological tangent of what exactly is wahi and how does wahi occur and what happens when a person is inspired wahi or inspiration is of course a direct communication from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mankind and Ibn al-Qayyim mentions that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was inspired by seven different means or methods or seven different ways because inspiration is not of one types. There's many different ways that the inspiration occurs. And the least of them, the lowest form of inspiration, is true dreams. And this is the only form of inspiration that is still open to mankind. All other types of inspiration have been cut off. The lowest form of inspiration is true dreams. And our Prophet ﷺ would see dreams before becoming a prophet and after becoming a prophet. He could see true dreams before becoming a prophet because true dreams are not restricted to prophets. Anybody can get true dreams. The second type of inspiration is the whisperings of the angels other than the angel Jibreel. This is called Ilham. The whisperings of the angel. And an example of this is 
uh, the mother of Musa being inspired by Allah. This doesn't make her a prophet. This type of inspiration does not make you a prophet. The mother of Musa was inspired by Allah. Allah says in the Quran, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ We inspired Ummi Musa. Does that make Ummi Musa a prophetess? No. Because this type of inspiration is different. And that is, uh, we will never understand it, but this is something that is, happens to the extremely righteous people uh, that Allah chooses. Similarly, the uh, uh, mother of Isa, Allah mentions in the Quran, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهَا That we inspired her, right? We told her that this type of inspiration, it, is, it doesn't make you a prophet or a prophetess. And it comes from uh, uh, Allah through the angels, that the angels give you this type of message to the heart. The third type of uh, inspiration is to see the angel in front of you directly and to speak to the angel directly. And this is what happened with Iqra, it happened with Ya Ayyuhal Muddathir, it happened many, many times that Jibreel would come to the Prophet and speak to him directly. And usually when Jibreel would come to him, he would come to him in the form of a Sahabi by the name of Dihya Al Kalbi. This was in Medina, not in Mecca. In Mecca, he would not take the form of Dihya. In, Ma in Medina, he would take the form of Dihya because Dihya is an Ansari. Dihya was in Medina, not in Mecca. And he would take the form of Dihya. And Dihya was considered to be the most handsome of all of the Sahaba. He was considered to be the most handsome of all of the Sahaba. And therefore Jibreel would just pretend to be in the form of Dihya. And then come and people would see him and think he's Dihya. But he was not Dihya, he was Jibreel. And Aisha on more than one occasion saw the Prophet talking to Dihya. And then she asked, what did Dihya want from you? And the Prophet said, that wasn't Dihya, that was Jibreel who had come to me. And the Prophet recognized him. Uh, but other people would think that this is Dihya. This is the third type of Wahi. The fourth type of Wahi is that... So the third type, the angel transforms to a human form. The angel becomes human-like. And the Prophet sees him, sometimes the Sahaba see him, sometimes they don't. Sometimes Jibreel will come and they couldn't see him. And sometimes he would come, as in the famous hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab, right? When we were sitting with the Prophet ﷺ, that he was extremely white in his clothing, extremely black in his hair, and not a, sp a spot of d dust on him. And this turned out to be Jibreel. Usually when Jibreel will come, the Sahaba would be in the form of a man, the Sahaba would see him. But sometimes they would not uh, see him. This was easier for the Prophet ﷺ to bear. That when Jibreel became a human, or looked like a human, the Prophet ﷺ remained in his form. He remained how he was. And he could communicate directly with Jibreel. There was a more difficult inspiration, and that is number four now. Right? We're number four now. Number four, Jibreel would remain in his form. He wouldn't transfer into a human. And the Prophet would, something would happen to him. We don't know what, it's never gonna, we're never going to understand. But he would go into what we would call a trance. We would call it in English a trance. That he would lower his face, his eyes would close, and the world around him becomes unknown. Doesn't matter what's happening, he's in his own world. And that is the world of Wahi. And Jibreel is in his original form, meaning that the Prophet some something's happening to him to communicate with Jibreel. That he is getting some type of difference. Now what it is, we're never going to know. This is Ilm al ghaib But he would go into this trance, and in this state, Aisha says, I have seen him on multiple times, that when the Wahi was coming down on a cold day, he would break into a sweat. It's very difficult for him. And on another hadith, in another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, when Surah Al-Ma'idah came down, the Prophet ﷺ was on a camel. And Surah Al-Ma'idah was so heavy, the camel had to sit down. This is Surah Al-Ma'idah being revealed, right? The Sahaba cannot see anything. And camels can carry, mashallah, how many hundreds of pounds and kilograms. When Ma'idah came down, uh, the Prophet ﷺ on the camel, the camel had to sit down. Shows you how difficult, if this was the camel, imagine our Prophet ﷺ, as Allah says in the Qur'an, إِنَّا سَنُلْقِ عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا We're going to give you a heavy speech. And this was the heavy speech. Also it is narrated that once the Prophet ﷺ was, on, was resting on the lap of one of the Sahaba, and he was, wahi began, and the Sahaba felt a pressure, and a pressure, and a pressure, and a pressure, until he thought that his thigh bone would crack. 
Can you imagine the thigh bone cracking because of the pressure of the wahi? This shows us that this was a very difficult process for our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hakim ibn Hizam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hadith Bukhari. Hakim ibn Hizam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Kayfa ya Rasulullah? How does wahi come to ya Rasulullah? So he told us numbers three and four, even though there's more than these. He says, sometimes Jibreel comes to me in the form of a man. And I understand what he says. And sometimes he communicates with me and I hear a noise like the ringing of a bell. It's very, he's comparing a noise like the ringing of a bell. It's a very loud noise. It's difficult to bear. He's hearing something. This is a type of buzz, a type of noise. And this one is more difficult for me. That's what we just said now. That Jibreel doesn't become a man. Jibreel stays in his form of an angel. But the Prophet ﷺ enters the world of wahi. The world of ilm al ghayb whatever it is going to be. And he communicates with Jibreel in a manner. And in both of these, the Prophet ﷺ said, and I understand what he tells me. The fifth type of wahi uh, was when he saw Jibreel in Jibreel's original form. In other words, Jibreel manifested himself to the Prophet ﷺ in his original form. And scholars have differed how many times this happened. For sure it happened twice. Once when Iqra was revealed, that was the original form. And once in the journey of Isra and Mi'raj. And some scholars add a third time. But these are the two that we know that Jibreel showed himself in his original form. What is his original form? All that we know is that he was so big he blocked the horizon. Couldn't see anything else. And he had 600 wings. 600. So that's the largest number of wings that the angels have. Because Jibreel is the most noble of all angels. So the Prophet saw Jibreel in Jibreel's original form. The sixth type of wahi, the sixth type of wahi is the wahi that... Uh, this is something that is disputed how and when it occurred. Uh, but Ibn Qayyim mentions it. Allah inspired him directly with, without the intermediary of the angels. Allah inspired him directly, wahi, without the intermediary of the angels. And this is something that Ibn Qayyim uh, mentions. And I don't have an example. I don't, I, I'm, I'm still wondering whether this one I would agree with or not. Allah knows best. But this is Ibn Qayyim mentions. The seventh, so I'm quoting what Ibn Qayyim mentions. The seventh is the highest form of wahi possible. And that is. Allah's direct speech. Allah's direct speech bila wasita. Right? Number six is Allah's direct wahi. Number seven is Allah's direct kalam. Kalamullah. Kalamullah. And that happened once to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the journey of Al Isra al Mi'raj. Only once did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak directly. Jibreel was not there. As we will discuss in a few weeks, inshallah, when we get there, even Jibreel said, you go on, Ya Muhammad, I cannot go. I don't have permission. I don't have the past to go beyond this. And so our Prophet went to a place where he could hear the scribes writing. And, كَادَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى And he was closer than two bow's lengths. And uh, he could see the hijab of Allah Azza wa Jal. When he was asked, did you see your Lord? He said, how could I see him? There was a hijab of light. And he saw this light of the veil. And that was when Allah spoke to him directly. Like Allah spoke to Musa. However, our Prophet was preferred over Musa. And Musa is indeed worthy of preference and respect. But our Prophet was preferred over Musa. In that, Allah spoke to Musa on Turi Sayna. But Allah called our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to His presence in above the seven heavens. And so... Our Prophet ﷺ reached a maqam that no other Prophet ever reached before. And of course, after him there is no Prophet. Now, some scholars claim that our Prophet ﷺ, he became a Nabi through the revelation of Iqra. And he became a Rasul through the revelation of Ya'yul Muddathir Qum Fa'andir. That when Iqra Bismi Rabbi came down, that's when he became a Nabi. And then when Ya Ayyuhal Muddathir Qum Fa'andir was revealed, he became a Rasul. So this leads us to another tangent, which is again useful and interesting and we should know it. And that is, if that is the case, well then, what exactly is a Nabi? And what exactly is a Rasul? 
And what is exactly the question I was gonna ask you after the part one? I wrote it here, like Nabi Rasul. Like I was gonna ask you, what's the difference? So I think it's gonna tell us, which is gonna be good for me because I don't know. Difference between a Nabi and a Rasul, and what was our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? There are many opinions about this issue. I will only mention to you four of them for the sake of brevity. Uh, the first of these opinions. One group of scholars said there is no difference between a Nabi and a Rasul. Nabi equals Rasul. And Rasul equals Nabi. They're synonyms. Just like Tawbah and Istighfar are synonyms. Just like Zakat and Sadaqah are synonyms. So Nabi and Rasul are synonyms. Every Nabi is a Rasul, every Rasul is a Nabi. This doesn't seem to be the strongest opinion because of many, many, many reasons. Of them is the verse in the Quran in which Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ We didn't send before you either a Rasul or a Nabi except that. Allah clearly says, مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِي and had they been the same thing, then this would be against the eloquence of the Arabic language to pray something like this. Had they been exactly the same, it doesn't make sense to put them together. And there are other evidences that are given. So it doesn't seem to be a very strong opinion that Rasul and Nabi are the same. Okay, so before he goes into the second opinion, um... We will end it here and continue tomorrow. At least we're getting the reasons. Because I wanted to ask you um, that. Uh, I guess there's no need. But if you still want to put your two cents in about the Nabi and Rasul, let me know down in the comments. And I'll try to read it after next episode. So that I don't get spoiled or spoilers. But I will still check it out once I react to the other part so anyways beautiful people um see you tomorrow thank you guys for joining bye